14. The Bible reads, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven there are angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? Jesus asked. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. We bless your name for this opportunity that you have given to all of us here. To come in the house of God and to hear from you alone. And this is the time when we are all here under you and to hear from you, O God. And I am here desperately in need of your presence to quicken all my weaknesses and corruptions so that I will be able by the power of the Holy Spirit to declare your precious word to your people. And I pray for them as well. For who is able to open the eyes of what the devil himself has blinded? If it is not only you who said, let there be light. Oh, I would pray that you will be pleased today to bring the light through the world to the people who are here this morning. I trust that you and you alone are going to do it and for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I have a message for you from God that comes from a context on how to deal, on how the church is to deal with sin. And this is the message for you this morning. God calls you to go after straying sheep with love to restore them back from sin. God calls you to go after straying sheep with love to restore them back from sin. And we have read verse 10 to 14, and that's the passage that I'm going to focus on today. But it has a context to it. So let us look at the context a little bit briefly as we head to our passage. So from verse 1 to 4, we see the disciples coming to Jesus Christ with a question. 
who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They asked Jesus. And let me ask you this question this morning. Whom do you think is the greatest in this church? Here? Are you thinking of yourself to be one of the greatest in this church? Or is somebody else's name popping up into your brain this morning? And by the which criteria are you using to judge who is the greatest in this church? This you see, the way the world defines greatness, it is always associated with accomplishment and achievement and status. And the disciples, they were asking among themselves, who is the greatest among us? Maybe James says, I'm the one. Peter says, no, 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 you are not, I'm the one. John, you, you, you just relax, I'm the one. And so finally they had to bring this question to Jesus. And they, they were anticipating Jesus to give them a specific name. Probably Peter, who was so vocal and, uh, you know, so energetic, who walked on the water probably. Who was with Jesus maybe at the transfiguration? And the ATC. But Jesus' response was so unexpected to the disciples. And he said that Jesus Christ called a little child who had no status, who had no accomplishment, who had no achievement. In fact, the child cannot even sustain himself. The child depends on the mercies and the grace of somebody else. And this is the child that Jesus says, this is the one who is the greatest in the kingdom. And this is how everyone must be if he is to enter into the kingdom. And so the point here that Jesus wanted the disciples to understand is this. That the greatness in the kingdom of God has nothing to do with your achievement. That the greatness of the greatness in the kingdom of God has nothing to do with your status or with what you have accomplished. But it has to do with the grace of God. It has to do with the humility that is produced by God's amazing grace. And that's what God, Jesus wanted his disciples to grasp. And that's what God wants you to grasp this morning. It is all about the humility that is produced out of the immeasurable grace of God. So from verse 5 to 9, Jesus is now starting calling woes to the world. <laughs> For the world itself is in enmity with God. And it has many causes for temptations. But be careful that you who is here this morning, you will not be one of those causes of temptation to these Little ones of Jesus Christ. For it would be better if a milestone could be tied on your neck and be cast in Lake Victoria. And so Jesus, knowing that even the disciples, even the church, who will have to deal with these temptations and sin and falling away. He narrows it now down to every believer. To everyone who is here this morning. And saying, if, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one 
leg than to go with both of your legs into her. And, and what Jesus Christ is saying here, he's saying we have to guard ourselves as believers. And to make sure that we are purging ourselves from anything that will lead us into temptation. But as we know, we still have the remaining corruption and the weakness and the lack of watchfulness in ourselves. We are going to fall. We are going to go astray. And do not expect that in this church there will not be those who will be struggling with sin. Or those who will go astray. Who are it might be even you in the days to come. And so the question is now how is the church to react to those who have gone astray? And so this takes us now to our passage today. <coughs> so that was our way of introduction. So the first point of God's message for you now is this. Do not despise Christ's believers who have fallen into sin. Do not despise Christ's believers who have gone astray. Look at it in the verse 10, it's right there. See that you do not despise one of these Little ones. Verse 10 starts with what we call an imperative, a command. It is not a suggestion. God is commanding you this morning to make sure that you do not despise one of these little ones. And the despise here also can mean to look down with content to somebody. That is what God is forbidding you to do. To his little ones. Now the question is, who are these little ones? That's a good question. If you go to verse 6, you will see that these little ones are not Azrael and, uh, and Maria and, uh, and these little ones. That's not what Jesus is talking about. But here, according to verse 6, the little ones, this is referring to those who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, these are those whom God has given to his son, Jesus Christ. They are believers. They are the true children of God. And these are the ones that we are called now to despise or to look down and so Jesus Christ is touching something that is at the core of human heart. For by nature, we are prone to despise, to underlook those who are fallen into sin. Let me ask you this question. In your life, when you have heard that somebody has been following Jesus Christ, who was in the church, and it happened that he has fallen into sin, what was your response when you heard about that? Just listen to the inner voice in your heart. What was your attitude to that? I remember when I was in one of the theological schools here in Uganda. And we had, you know, ladies who are also doing theology. And it happened that one of the ladies was pregnant. And the school made it public. And I guarantee you, all those whom I heard, they all fell into what God is forbidding us to do this morning. They ridiculed her. They despised her. They mocked her. They thought that they were better than her who had fallen into that sin. 
And whenever this attitude is creeping into the church, it's going to eat up the church. And Jesus is forbidding us from not doing that. Because once you start despising others, that's not the fruits of humility that derives from the grace that we receive from Christ. The good picture here is Simon Peter, who fell. And Jesus Christ came to him before and he told him that the devil has asked that he will sweep you like wheat. And in fact, the devil really shook Simon Peter. And if the devil, the devil had a full authority and full power over Peter, as John Gerson has said, Peter could have fallen just like Adam fell. But the reason why Peter did not fall, it was not because Peter was so mighty and strong in Christ. But the reason why Peter was able to stand was because Jesus Christ Pray for him. It is the prayer of Jesus that kept Peter from now. And we know that this Jesus Christ is in heaven even today. And he's still doing the same prayers for every one of us who is in Christ. And so the reason why you may be standing today is not because you are mightier than the one who has fallen. But the reason why we are all still standing is because Christ is interceding for us. And when you grasp this, it humbles you. It changes you from the attitude of despising those who are falling. And instead, you pray for them and you sympathize with them. But you standing is not because of you. It's because of the grace of God that's working in you. And so, here we see that Jesus Christ is telling the disciples, is telling us to get away from that temptation of feeling that we are more important than those who have fallen. And to avoid to despise them. So whenever you want to despise somebody, remember that God forbids it. And now Jesus goes on now to give us two reasons why we must not despise those who are fallen into sin. And the first reason is my second point here, which is remember that their angels are always in the presence of God. Remember that their angels are always in the presence of God. Look at it in verse 10, part B. It starts with four. In other words, because this is the reason why you must not despise them. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And so there are those who have developed a doctrine here called, uh, known as the guardian angels. And this doctrine teaches that every believer has his or her personal angel who protects and guides him or her while they are here on earth. And they use this to back up their arguments. But as you read the old Bible, you will realize that the Bible does not support this thing. For in the Bible, we don't see where angels are personalized to each and every believer. That when you, when the elect is born, or when he's saved, or when 
He dies. So we, the Bible doesn't tell us that God has given each believer a specific and the angel. What the Bible teaches us is that the angels, they are ministering spirits to serve all believers. And so here in verse 10, we are told that their angels in plural are in heaven in the presence of God. And so the very question that we have to ask ourselves is this. How does knowing that their angels are in heaven going to help me not to despise them? That's a good question. You see, whenever you are tempted to despise your brother and sister has fallen into sin. You have to remember that their heavenly father is in heaven. The creator of the universe. The most powerful God is there in heaven and he is their father. And he loves them so much. He values them so much to the extent that he has dispatched angels. According to Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 we see the work of angels. That they are work is to serve and to minister to believers such as those of God. So before you despise them, remember that their father loves them. He cares for them. And he has sent angels specifically to minister for their service. Let me give you an example to just get this point home. So we are all here in Uganda and we know the president of Uganda is Museveni. And we know that Museveni is the command in chief of the whole UPD. And we know that Museveni has his son called Muhozi. And he loves his son so much. He values his son so much to the extent that he has dispatched a special UPD force with the purpose and the mission to protect and to guard and to serve his only son. And so before you start even thinking about despising Muhoz, first of all, think about who his father is. The and when you behold the special force, let the special force be a reminder that Muhoz is not just any mere person in Uganda. That he is the son of the president. <laughs> And the UPDF is there to guard and to minister to him. So in the same way, before you start despising the little one that Jesus shed his blood for, remember that his father is the creator of the universe. Remember that his father has dispatched his angels to minister for him even though he is a stranger. And let that be a reminder for you and prevent you from despising him. Because God values you. That's the first reason. Which is the second, which was the second point of my message. Now, the second reason why you are not to despise them. And which is my third point. Your God will use you to keep his children from perishing. Your God will use you to keep his children from perishing. Look at it in verse 14. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these 
Little ones should perish. To put it in a, in, in a positive way, it's this. It is the definite will of God that not even a single one of his one little ones should be perished. Now, verse 14 does not say that they, the children of God, will not fall into sin. It does not say that. It does not say that there are times when sin will prevail and have an upper hand over his children. It does not say that. But what it is assuring us is that even though sin will prevail over God's children, but it will not totally prevail over them. That even though they go astray, but they will not finally go astray as the West Minister Confession of Faith put it. God will preserve, He will definitely bring His children back. And this must encourage us this morning to know that when our brothers and sisters are fallen, to go after them with boldness that if they are gods, God will bring them back. And so Jesus Christ being a perfect teacher, he brings a parable to take this point home. Which is that in verse 12. Jesus started by asking the disciples, What do you think? And I'm asking this morning, What do you think? That if a man has a hundred sheep and the one of them has gone astray just here Jesus is not talking about a hired servant but he's talking about a man who owns one hundred sheep they are his sheep and it happens that one of them goes astray. And the sheep that has gone astray, he knows that sheep. It is his. He even recalls probably when it was born. Jumping up and down as a lamb. He remembers the colors of that sheep. He even recalls the place where that specific sheep lays or sleeps. It is his, he knows it. And he knows very well that the sheep is vulnerable and weak and defenseless out there where it is. And he is aware that there are prayers and vicious animals surrounding that weak and vulnerable sheep. He knows all that. And in addition to this, he is by professional a shepherd. That is his job. It is his job to make sure that the sheep are safe. It is his job to make that the sheep are well protected. That is his professional. And Jesus is asking now, what will be his response? When he realizes that one has gone astray. Now, there are those who have given this kind of answer. They say that he will just ignore it. And their reason is in verse 12. Whereby he says, and does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains? And so they argue that he has ninety-nine sheep on the mountains. And only one 
percent of his one hundred percent has gone astray. And the sheep by nature they are defenseless. So it is not the principle of business for him to live the ninety-nine in the open mountains. Vulnerable as they may be there, and just go for one percent. This is not how business works. Losses are part of the world. So if it is only one, just let it go. They argue. And so if you bring the argument in the church, this is what it means. If a believer goes astray, after all, it's just only one or two. Who cares? Let them go as long as we still have the majority in the church. But this is not how the kingdom of God operates. For two reasons. In verse 13, we see. That uh, he says, and when he finds it, he rejoices over it more than the 99 that never, never went astray. So we are told that the 99 did not go astray, they were preserved by God's grace. And the second reason in verse 14, we are told that it is the will of God that not even single one will perish. So if it is God's heart that not even one of them will perish, how dare do you say, who cares if one goes astray? It is God's heart to go even after one that has gone astray. So there are times when the church has to put more emphasis, more emphasis, just in pursuing one sheep. Or putting many things on hold just for the sake of going after that one sheep. Because that is what God's heart is. It is to go after that one sheep. And they bring it back. So the safety of the little ones, those who have gone astray, it is not out there, but it is in the family of the church. And God has given us that responsibility. Not only the pastors, but everyone here who is in the cross, it is your responsibility to go after that one sheep that has gone astray. And as you do that, remember the promise that God has given us in verse 14. That it is His will, it is the will of God. That not even one will go astray. Go after that sheep. With boldness, knowing that God has promised that if it is His, He will bring it back. And be motivated by that, that God is going to use me. I'm going to be the tool in God's hand to go and bring back one of His lives. Go out there, bring them back. And so you see that this parable here is very important. Reminding all of us, or everyone of us this morning, that we are to go after those who have gone astray. And so you might be here this morning. And you are saying, Jeremy, you said those little ones. There are those who believe in Christ Jesus, yes, they are Christ's. And there may be the Holy Spirit may be whispering into your heart that you are not even part of that one that has gone astray. That you still lost. And the Holy Spirit is whispering into your heart, but God is coming after you. 
Remember that Jesus left the heaven specifically for you. That he shed his blood so that his righteousness will bring you home. Never suppresses that voice. Give heed to that voice. And embrace that voice in repentance and in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be his. And he is promising you that he will never let you go in. He will never be lost. He will hold you fast. That's the beautiful song we sang this morning. For he will hold us fast. Even when temptations prevail, crush, crush. So may you run to him. He's stretching his hand. May you come to me, all you who are weary and very and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And you may be here this morning and you have embraced him. And probably you are struggling with sin. And sometimes the temptation is to despise yourself. Because God calls others not to despise you, but you may be despising yourself. Let me encourage you this morning. That God will never let you go. That trust not in yourself, trust in him who holds us fast. And know that God loves you. And if you have a friend who has gone astray, make your goal this week. Let's give him a call. Trusting that God in his due time, will bring him So to God alone be the glory. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you for who you are. You are our God. Thank you so much that as we are here this morning, standing as we are, we know it's because you hold us fast. We know it's because you are interceding for us. We know it's because you keep us. How to pray that God will get out of this place, that we will run away from the temptation of despising those of one. But with the heart of humility, driven from the fact that it is the grace of God that keeps us as well. And to run to them with the confidence and the promise that God will by definitely bring his people home. May you send us all this place as we go and meditate upon this. And think about your goodness and take it to those who have gone astray and they remind them about the goodness of God that in God they will definitely come back and so we bless you and we pray all this in Jesus Amen.